It is June 1st, 2023. The Colorado Rockies are 24 and 34, fifth in the NL West, 10 and a half games back of the Diamondbacks for first place in the division, five and a half games back of the final wild card spot. And yet again, the worst team in the National League by record. Prospects were on the move within the organization this week. A key pitcher has returned from the injured list. And let's talk Freeland, Bard, Lawrence, Moustakis, and Wins. This is Adjusting for Altitude. Baseball is a difficult game. The average hitter gets on base in less than 40% of their plate appearances, yet the average pitcher gives up four runs every nine innings pitched. The sport is a challenge on its own, but in altitude, the problems for baseball players compound. Less break on pitches, balls that fly significantly farther than at sea level, and then after playing in such a treacherous environment, the players play in normality for half of their regular season. Adjustments must be made by those who don the purple pinstripes of the Colorado Rockies. We discuss those adjustments here. This is Adjusting for Altitude with baseball fanatic and aspiring MLB general manager, Christopher Nelson II. From the great state of Colorado, nestled at the foot of the Rocky Mountains, welcome to Adjusting for Altitude, a Colorado Rockies podcast, analyzing the unique challenges faced by the players of the only MLB team that plays a mile above sea level. Streaming on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, or wherever podcasts can be streamed on the World Wide Web, I am your host, Christopher Nelson II. As per usual, if you don't already, you should go follow me on social media at I am the second to keep up with me in my life or just interact with me about anything, not just Rockies baseball. My DMs are always open and we're about to hop into yet another entertaining discussion about the Colorado Rockies. But if you haven't listened to last week's episode, go ahead and do so. Last week, we discussed the contributions of Chase Anderson, a veteran starter relatively new to the club, Carl Kaufman, a Rockies rookie pitching prospect who contributed briefly over the last three weeks, Nick Mears, a promising right-handed reliever, Harold Castro, a solid utility man, and Alan Trejo, the versatile middle infielder. Like I said, add that episode to your podcast queue if you haven't heard it already. Other than that, the Colorado Rockies have been playing better baseball as of late, by their standards at least. Over the last week, they took two of three from the Mets at home over the weekend uh, before getting swept by the Diamondbacks in a four-game series on the road, which included a walk-off in the final game of the series. Yeah, not very good. Rockies pitching has given up at least five runs in each of the last nine games, meaning success is mostly dependent on what the offense has given the club on any given night. But there are a lot of roster moves made over the last week. Shall we discuss a few of those? The Colorado Rockies are a Major League Baseball organization with many happenings and occurrences. Chris, what's been going on? So there were, there were a variety of miscellaneous intermediary moves made throughout the last week. So I'm only going to cover the moves that ultimately shape the roster as it's currently constructed. So let's begin. Nolan Jones was recalled from AAA Albuquerque and Michael Tolia was demoted. Now, Tolia was initially called up a few weeks ago. I want to say like three or four weeks ago when CJ Crone initially went on the injured list and Tolia struggled in his brief stint with the club slashed 174 with a 240 on base 457 OPS in about 10 games played. Not very good. So they sent him back down to AAA to work out a few things technically and otherwise in regards to his approach at the plate. Nolan Jones, however, has been scorching at AAA. And for those of you who are relatively unfamiliar with who Nolan Jones is, Nolan was acquired in a trade with the Guardians over the offseason. He was formerly a top 100 MLB prospect, and the Rockies believe Nolan has a lot to offer this club, especially in years to come. Um, just so versatile in what he can do. So far at AAA this season at Albuquerque, he's slashing 356 with a 481 on base, a 1.192 OPS, 12 home runs, 42 runs batted in, in addition to five stolen bases. So no one's been doing it all so far for Albuquerque this season. And um, yeah, so far at the major league level, he's kind of translated a lot of that into his game. Uh, 278 
batting average, 316 on base, and an 872 OPS through his first six games played with a home run and three RBIs, mostly out of the bottom spot in the lineup. Well, not necessarily the bottom spot, but out of the bottom end of the lineup. Uh, he figures to primarily play first base while Crone is still on the mend, but he can also play third base a little bit, mostly corner outfield. That's his primary spot. So like left field, right field, that's where he's played for most of the season at AAA at least. Another move that was made over the last week was the recall of Elleris Montero from AAA. And while this wasn't the direct move, Chris Bryant was also sent to the 10-day IL with a left heel bruise. We made it about 50-plus games into the season this season before Chris Bryant ended up on the injured list. I think that's something worth celebrating. But, I mean, Montero started the year on the club. He was initially the starting third baseman to begin the year. Struggled defensively mostly. He also struggled with strikeouts, and he got sent down in the month of April. And at AAA, he has absolutely raked, like we're talking raking, 383 batting average, 435 on base percentage with a 1.200 OPS, including 13 home runs and 38 RBIs. So Montero's been swinging it at AAA. Will he translate it back to the major leagues? I'm sure we'll find out over the next few weeks in the playing time that he gets. They'll probably factor into the first base spot, kind of mixing in with Jones and Moustakis while Crone is still on the IL. He might also DH against the lefties when that opportunity presents itself. Another move that was made during the last week was Denelson Lamette getting a recall from AAA Albuquerque. Finally, being reinstated off the injured list and Carl Kaufman and Blair Calvo who kind of were up individually and recalled and sent down in individual moves uh, ultimately both ended up back with the isotopes in Albuquerque at AAA. Lamette made his first start since 2021 yesterday actually on Wednesday night against the Diamondbacks uh, through three innings gave up five runs seven hits four strikeouts no walks all in all, it wasn't a terrible night for his first start in the majors in just about two years. Uh, still some things to work on for Lamette. Obviously, he's still getting wound up to be a starter, which it appears the Rockies will keep him as a starter uh, for the next uh, foreseeable future, I guess. It looks like there's really no reason to have that change. He hasn't really been good out of the bullpen. It might as well experiment with something new. And even in his start on Wednesday, he, it's not like he was giving up extra base hit after extra base hit. He was quite honestly getting singled to death uh, in those first few innings, but he recovered nicely. And in the third, I believe he struck out two batters before getting a ground out. And then he reached his pitch limit and was removed for Peter Lambert. I believe it was uh, Carl Kaufman was fine in his first three weeks in the major leagues. He has some technical things he still has to work on and his fastball command killed him, especially in his last start against the Diamondbacks on Memorial Day. Only threw four innings, gave up seven runs, nine hits, one strikeout to two walks. So uh, we talked about Kaufman on last week's episode. He has some things he's working on for sure, but he was actually optioned for Blake or Blair, excuse me, Blair Calvo, uh, who made his Rockies debut on Tuesday evening with a scoreless inning of relief. Um, he hasn't been terrible, all things considered, for the isotopes in AAA, uh, the PCL, the Pacific Coast League, is usually known to be a hitter's league where pitchers struggle a lot more. He's 1-2 and two with an 8.5 ERA in AAA this season, but he has 26 strikeouts to 9 walks, so that's obviously a good strikeout-to-walk ratio. I think he's very promising for the future in terms of Rockies relievers. Works a very solid fastball slider mix. Uh, low spin rate fastball too. You'll love to see the low spin rate fastball. So I definitely think Blair Calvo has a chance to contribute sometime towards maybe the later end of the season next year for sure. So that's what's been going on transactionally within the organization. And we're about to hop into five minute analysis in just a second. But before we do, there was a thought that came to mind over this last week, to me at least. We've discussed on this show in some depth the benefits of having a low spin rate fastball and being a pitcher who pitches at Coors Field. And in the times that I've talked about my ideal pitcher's mold for Coors Field on this podcast, I made it very clear what that mold is. A low spin rate, high velocity fastball used about 50% of the time, just in summary a slider that's a high spin rate slider over 2,500 RPMs that's used about 23% of the time. I also said that a changeup should factor in 
around 17% of the time, I believe it was. And we want that to be a low spin rate pitch as well. But the curveball is kind of a pitch that I left off, mostly because it's the pitch, the breaking pitch rather, that's most affected by altitude as compared to the slider. Therefore, I don't really see a reason for pitchers who the Rockies are looking at making key contributors to this team in the long term using a curveball frequently. However, that was a curveball that I projected as a high spin rate curveball. Since I figured that breaking pitches like sliders are best utilized when they're thrown with high spin rates because they're less impacted by altitude as compared to fastballs. I might be wrong, ladies and gentlemen, as it pertains to the idea of a high spin rate curveball being the ideal curveball for a pitcher at Coors Field. Could potentially a low spin rate curveball be the way to go? Could it potentially be the case? Well, Let's take a look, shall we? A curveball, for all intents and purposes, is the anti-fastball. You know, same spin idea, but the complete opposite execution. Fastball has 6 to 12 movement across your analog clock, and a curveball has 12 to 6 movement. As such, we should be analyzing curveball and fastball movement and spin rate similarly, but opposite. Fastballs tend to have late rise, late cut, late sink. Curveballs tend to have late drop. As such, high spin rate fastballs will rise, cut, and sink more the closer they get to home plate. High spin rate curveballs will drop more the closer they get to home plate. Interesting, isn't it? Low spin rate fastballs and curveballs, however, exhibit the opposite effect. Low spin rate fastballs will rise, cut, and sink earlier in their trajectory to home plate, and low spin rate curveballs will drop earlier in their trajectory towards the plate. Interesting something I hadn't really considered before. So the question ultimately is, which do you want as a Coors Field pitcher? And aside from that even, which is more feasible to attain success with at Coors Field? Well, in my comparisons with several pitchers and their film, this is the conclusion I came to. Based on the film, it appears that high spin rate fastballs away from Coors Field establish an early plane on their trajectory, seemingly rising on their trajectory towards home plate. Again, the idea that they rise, cut, and sink the closer that they get to home plate. High spin rate fastballs at Coors Field, however, establish that early plane, but seemingly drop on their trajectory towards home plate, and the opposite effect as compared to other MLB venues, obviously. However, a low spin rate fastball away from Coors Field establishes an early plane, but moves straight towards its target with minimal rise effect, but it, it just kind of goes where it needs to go, where it's been aimed to go without much of an effect on the way there. Likewise, low spin rate fastballs at Coors Field establish an early plane moving straight towards the target with minimal drop effect. So ultimately, the same effect is realized with a low spin rate fastball away and at Coors Field. High spin rate curveballs on film away from Coors Field maintain an early plane before the ball drops late. And by late, I mean closer to home plate. They exhibit more movement, more perceived quick and deceptive movement, that is. But high spin rate curveballs at Coors Field maintain their early plane before the ball drops late. However, because of the altitude difference, there's less movement. About two inches less movement, less drop, that is, will be perceived because, well, two inches less drop is being experienced by the pitch. And that less movement results in less perceived quick and deceptive movement. However, on film, low spin rate curveballs away from Coors Field do not maintain an early plane as the ball drops earlier in its trajectory to home plate. Less movement overall, but a more perceived sustained movement experienced by the batter. It's a very interesting effect, actually. It looks like the pitch is actually just moving more for a, an extended period of time like a curveball. It goes up and comes down in a more sustained manner as compared to the high spin rate curveball. But here's the kicker. Low spin rate curveballs at Coors Field according to the film of pitchers who throw low spin rate curveballs do not maintain their early plane and the ball drops earlier, but it again exhibits less movement overall because of the altitude, but the sustained perceived movement remains constant and significantly impacts the batter's ability to make contact with the pitch. It is very, very interesting, very interesting. And there's no one who exhibits this idea better than Nick Mears. We talked about Nick on last week's episode two, I believe. He's thrown 28 curveballs thus far this season. Again, a relatively small sample size for a reliever. But on those 28 curveballs, like we mentioned, he hasn't given up a ball in play yet. He has six strikeouts on that pitch. 
So naturally looking at this, I was like, wow, what is Nick doing with his curveball that's making it so effective almost 30 pitches into the season? Well, I did some digging and I found that Nick has thrown four curveballs that have induced swinging strikes from batters. Two of those batters swung way early at the pitch and were way out in front. Two batters swung under the pitch. One of those, each of those circumstances occurred at home at Coors Field and on the road. Very interesting. Very consistent. See, here's the thing. Being on top of the curveball would suggest that the batter anticipated less break. Being under the curveball would suggest the opposite. So ultimately, Nick Mears might be demonstrating something very crucial before our eyes. Low spin rate curveballs can be just as effective as high spin rate curveballs, potentially more so considering that most pitchers seek to throw high spin rate curveballs and the league doesn't really see a ton of effective low spin rate curveballs regularly, especially at high velocity. So why again does the issue of low spin rate curveballs matter for Colorado Rockies pitchers? For the same reason that a low spin rate fastball does easier control and command at both Coors Field and on the road, in addition to presenting batters with a deceptive pitch that moves in a way they rarely see. Well, that's that. Let's discuss some in-depth analytics and adjustments for the gentleman donning the purple pinstripes this week. Three Rockies pitchers, two Rockies position players, five-man analysis is on the way. Coming up next, this is Adjusting for Altitude. Stay tuned. Using advanced MLB analytics and eye test comparisons, let's discuss the performance of five Colorado Rockies thus far this season. This is Five Man Analysis. All right, all right. On today's pitcher's segment of Five Man Analysis, we have a veteran starter that is struggling in several aspects of his performance, a veteran reliever struggling to recover his all-star caliber season from just a year ago, and a young reliever maintaining his early season success. We'll kick it off with pitcher number one. Player number one. Player number one today is Kyle Freeland, currently the ace of the Colorado Rockies rotation. Thus far in 2023, Kyle is four and six with a 4.22 ERA, 6.4, well, 64 innings pitched. Rather, uh, in 64 innings pitched, he has 43 strikeouts, 17 walks, a 4.97 FIP, a 1.31 whip, good for an ERA plus of 120, 20 percentage points better than the league average pitcher. His performance has declined a tad bit since we last analyzed him, but let's take a look at what he's rocking with thus far into the season distribution-wise. So far, he's throwing his sinker 30% of the time at 89 miles an hour, his slider 20% of the time at 85 miles an hour, his curveball 19% of the time at 80 miles an hour, his four-seam fastball 18% of the time at 89 miles per hour, and his changeup 12% of the time at 84 miles per hour. Again, we see that limited pitch disparity speed-wise that I was talking about on the first episode that we just, that we discussed Kyle's performance. And we also see, as compared to the last time we talked about Kyle, that he's using his sinker and slider less, roughly 3% less and 4% less, respectively. He's also throwing the curveball, four seam, and the changeup more, roughly 2%, 3%, and 2%, respectively. Those are pretty solid adjustments for Freeland. Um, he's still in the blue in most percentile categories. However, he's improved by 12 percentage points in regards to chase rate since we last discussed him. He's in the 33rd percentile up from the 21st percentile that he was a few weeks ago. Still firmly in the red in walk rate, 74th percentile in that category, but he's still throwing a very spinny fastball and has been hit harder recently as well. Unfortunately, he's in the 46th percentile in barrel percentage down from 55th percentile. Overall, Kyle will continue to struggle if he doesn't lower his fastball spin rate and his low velo coupled with that high spin rate fastball and the small velo differential between his pitches as a whole makes his sinker and his four seam fastball easier to pick up for hitters, especially his sinker, which he throws most of the time. Like I just mentioned, hitters are able to make solid contact on those pitches. In fact, about 61% of his sinkers and fastballs that get put in play are hit at exit velos 90 miles an hour or harder. Considering Kyle throws a fastball, both sinker and changeup at 89 miles or sinker and four seam, that is at 89 miles an hour. Um, not good. Not good at all. 
Uh, but how does Kyle stack up against a pitcher similar to him? This is going to be something that we're doing for the first time on this podcast, comparing Kyle to his contemporaries. And I think a good comparison to Kyle so far this season is a pitcher by the name of Tommy Henry, a starting pitcher for the Diamondbacks, who the Rockies actually faced Wednesday evening, I believe it was. So far on the season for the Diamondbacks, Tommy Henry is 3-1 and one with a 3.73 ERA in 41 innings pitched. He has 25 strikeouts, 16 walks, a 5.21 FIP, a 1.24 WHIP, and a 117 ERA+. Plus. You know, based on this, one might say Kyle has been the better pitcher than Tommy Henry thus far in 2023. However, I might actually argue the contrary. Here's the distribution that Tommy Henry is rocking with so far in 2023. He's rocking with a four-seam fastball. He throws it 51% of the time at 91 miles per hour. He throws a changeup 23% of the time at 84 miles per hour, a curveball 18% of the time at 79 miles per hour, and a slider 8% of the time at 83 miles per hour. While lower than Freeland's, Henry's curveball spin is very similar to Kyle's. Uh, within 100 RPMs worth of difference, right around 2,300 RPMs in total on average. Uh, however, his slider and changeup spin rates are both over 100 RPMs slower than Kyle Freeland's, and the slower slider spin doesn't necessarily help Tommy Henry, but ultimately it's not really impactful to his performance uh, considering the slider is Henry's least used pitch and not his primary breaking ball. The most important disparity between Freeland and Henry, however, is the fastball spin rate between the two. Now, while both pitchers are obviously low velo pitchers, um, Henry's fastball is roughly 200 RPM slower than Kyle Freeland's. And while both pitchers' primary fastballs have a batting average against around 300, uh, which is not very good, the average exit velo on Henry's fastballs is 90 miles an hour, roughly the same as the velo that he throws the pitch at. Freeland's average exit velo on his sinker is 94 miles per hour, roughly five miles per hour harder than the velo that he throws the pitch at. Henry arguably uses his primary pitch better than Freeland, allowing him to better set up his secondary pitches, which would explain the 171 batting average against and sub 225 weighted on base averages that Henry possesses on his changeup and curveball, both of which are better than Freeland by over 80 percentage points, which is roughly 8%. It's a significant margin. By the way, I don't know if we've discussed weighted on base average on this podcast yet. That might very well be a new statistic that I'm just introducing now. Pretty much all weighted on base average is um, WOBA for short. It's just a version of on-base percentage that accounts for how a player reaches base instead of simply considering whether a player has reached base. So it's a little bit more accurate. Uh, that's why WOBA is usually regarded as one of the better sabermetric-advanced stats to keep track of. Overall, uh, I, think it, I think it's interesting. Uh, I think that sabermetrics and stats like these kind of demonstrate that Henry is a better pitcher than Freeland right now. But I don't think Freeland can, I think Freeland actually, no, I think he can. I think Kyle Freeland can be a better pitcher than Tommy Henry and other pitchers who profile similarly to him. All he has to do is lower the spin rate on his sinker and his fastball and, and make it more effective as a pitch. Now, it's easier said than done. It requires some adjustments to the way that the pitcher holds the grip. But again, Kyle's paid multiple millions of dollars a year. He puts lots of time and energy into becoming a very good Major League Baseball pitcher, I think that's an adjustment that he could make. It'll also improve his command and control between his starts at Coors Field and on the road uh, with less pitch movement to worry about and with the increased usage rate of the changeup that Kyle has already demonstrated, as we mentioned a little bit earlier. He could ride that combination well, like very successfully over the course of the season and continue to improve upon himself as a pitcher. And he's already an above average pitcher this season, but it's not just about remaining there. It's about identifying areas where you can improve and actually improving in those areas. In his starts, watch for Kyle to work off the sinker, a pitch that'll be thrown roughly 89 to 90 miles an hour, and will move downward towards his arm side. So since he's a left-handed pitcher, it'll move towards his arm side, towards the left, back towards where it came from. And if he can effectively fool batters by generating weak contact on that pitch, his breaking pitches and his changeup will be better utilized in those starts, and he'll likely have a good outing. 
Player number two. Player number two is Daniel Bard, arguably an all-star closer in 2022, although he was not named to the all-star game. CJ Crone was named the Rockies all-star for 2022. Uh, Bard put up all-star caliber numbers, 34 saves, a 2.86 FIP, and a 2.62 ERA plus. Easily one of the best late inning relievers in the game. And that's what Bard finds himself in this season as well, in a late inning reliever type of role. However, he's no longer the closer for this team. And that's despite posting stats that look like this. He's 1-0 with a .57 ERA in 15.2 innings pitched. He has 11 strikeouts, 11 walks, a 5.2 FIP, a 1.12 or 1.21 WHIP rather, good for an 898 ERA plus, 898. That is 798 percentage points better than the major league average pitcher, and he's doing it on effectively four pitches. A slider that he throws 49% of the time at 87 miles an hour, a sinker that he throws 43% of the time at 95 miles per hour, a slurve that he throws 4% of the time at 82 miles per hour, a four-seam fastball that he throws 4% of the time at 95 miles per hour, and a changeup that he throws, well, he's only thrown one, actually, this season at 90 miles per hour. So far, Bard hasn't thrown enough to be considered across the wider array, the more broad array of percentile ranking metrics, but we do know that he's 90th percentile in fastball spin rate and 79th percentile in fastball velocity. So the ultimate question that a lot of Rockies fans might be asking is, why is the guy with an 898 ERA+, plus, 798 percentage points better than the Major League average pitcher, a borderline all-star from a year ago, not the closer? for the team this year and has rarely been relied upon in tight situations. Well, to be fair, we're going to have to take a little bit of a look back into Bard's career to understand why he doesn't find himself in many high leverage tight situations in 2023. You see, Bard has actually been in MLB since 2009, spending most of those years with the Red Sox as a reliever. But in 2013, he took seven years off the game after yips, significantly impacted his performance on the field. He later returned to pitching after a quick coaching stint with a few teams uh, with the Rockies in 2020. And in the short and 2020 season, he won MLB's comeback player of the year in the national league, posting a four and two record, a 3.65 ERA, uh, 27 strikeouts to 10 walks, a 3.64 FIP, a 1.29 whip good for an ERA plus of 143. He struggled in 2021 a little bit, but he bounced back well in 22, as I mentioned earlier, perennial all-star type of player. This year, he began the season on the IL with anxiety, and since returning, his command and his control of pitches has been very, very questionable. I mean, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, he's walked as many batters as he struck out. His FIP is nearly double what it was a year ago, suggesting that circumstantial occurrences have significantly contributed to his early season success this season, Bard simply isn't the same pitcher as he was a year ago. And matter of fact, of his 275 pitches that he's thrown in 2023, 119 have have not been in the strike zone. That's 43% of his pitches have not been in the conventional strike zone. And of those 119 pitches, 86 have been balls. That's 72% of the pitches that have not been in the strike zone called balls. And many of those balls here's the kicker, haven't even been competitive pitches. They've been bad misses. We're talking bad slider misses, bad fastball misses, just bad misses, wild pitches, etc. A good comparison, I think, for Daniel Bard this season would be Genesis Cabrera, a reliever for the Cardinals. So far in 2023, Cabrera is 1-0 with a 4.95 ERA in 20 innings pitched. He has 28 strikeouts to 13 walks, a 5.03 FIP, a 1.55 whip, and an 87 ERA plus, so slightly below average um, as a reliever in Major League Baseball. He's doing it with this pitch distribution, a slider thrown at 40% of the time at 89 miles an hour, a four-seam fastball thrown 34% of the time at 95 miles per hour, a curveball thrown at 15% of the time at 79 miles per hour, a changeup and sinker, both are used at 5% of the time at 89 miles per hour and 95 miles per hour respectively. Cabrera is kind of a rarity among MLB relievers in that he throws five pitches at least 5% of the time. Most major league relievers only throw about two or three pitches max. Uh, but 
overall, the, the similarities between Cabrera and Bard are fairly similar, right? They both throw their slider and fastball most of the time with decent effectiveness batting average against Wise. However, Cabrera's spin rate is significantly different than Bard's and that it's very much lower. With his primary fastball rotating over 200 RPMs less than Bard's and his slider rotating over 400 RPM less than Bard's. Again, the low slider spin rate isn't necessarily a good thing for Cabrera, all things considered, but he mixes in a second breaking pitch, that curveball, which ultimately makes his slider more effective despite its poor rotations per minute. For Bard, I think it's all in the fastball. The high RPMs make it a harder pitch for him to control, and when you aren't feeling fully confident in your abilities in general, that problem gets amplified a lot. Also, besides using the slider more than his fastball so far in 2023, which he didn't do in 2022, um, Bard's fastball velo has declined roughly three miles per hour from 2022. Uh, whether that's age or other unrelated issues, uh, I, I don't really know what the problem or what the reason for that would be. Ultimately, Bard just needs to regain his confidence, and he can do that really easily by making his life easier, limiting his fastball spin, adjusting that technique a little bit, simply throwing the ball hard at a spot and going back to the very, very simple basics of pitching. I think that'll improve his pitch command and control, lower his walk rate, and also reduce the amount of just bad misses that he has in his outings very frequently. In his relief appearances, watch for Bard's fastball velo to be above 95 miles per hour. If he's throwing the fastball hard with good command and control, it'll likely mean that he's going to have a good outing. Player number three. Player number three is Justin Lawrence, our eighth inning setup reliever. And he's still in that job, just like he was at the beginning of the season. And just like the beginning of the season, he's still dominating pretty well. Two and two so far in 2023 with a 3.07 ERA. A 20 In 29.1 innings pitched, he has 32 strikeouts, 12 walks, a 2.77 FIP, a 1.13 WHIP good for an ERA plus of 167. He's doing it on two pitches. Uh, his sweeper, which he throws 52% of the time at 84 miles per hour. Again, if you haven't listened to the previous episodes where we broke down the sweeper in a little bit more detail, effectively all a sweeper is, is it's a slider that's thrown with less vertical movement. So it's more side to side, more east to west if it's a right-handed pitcher, more west to east, if that makes sense, if it's a left-handed pitcher. So that's what a sweeper is. He also throws his sinker 48% of the time at 95 miles per hour. So those are the two pitches that Lawrence is rocking with so far to the tune of being 67 percentage points better than the average MLB reliever. One thing to notice about his pitch distribution, distribution that is, is that he's balanced the use of his sweeper and sinker using the sinker about four percentage points more and the sweeper about four percentage points less than he did the first time we evaluated Justin on this podcast. He has had a significant impact ex, you know, impact experience, that is, on his pitching. The more he's made these pitches closer to 50-50 in usage rate, funny enough, it's led to a slight increase in his whip by about 0.2, uh, mostly because he's giving up more hits with the increased usage of his primary fastball, but his FIP, has actually dropped by about 0.5, which I think is a lot more significant than the slight increase in the whip. Uh, that suggests that he's becoming less circumstantially reliant on outcomes to succeed in his outings. And this is supported by the fact that he's now in the 70th percentile in the league in strikeout percentage, up from 13 percentage points. Lawrence has also improved his effectiveness in the strike zone, represented by the fact that he's now above average in hard hit percentage at 54th, or in the 54th percentile, rather. That's up seven percentile points in regard, um, and he's also up, rather. He's also up seven percentile points in regard to whiff rate. Um, his chase rate has declined a tad bit, but I think overall the fact that Justin is becoming more comfortable in the strike zone while remaining effective in his role as a late-game setup reliever is very encouraging, especially for the long term. I think he's in a very, very good spot. I think a good comparison for Lawrence so far in 2023 would be John Schreiber, a reliever for the Red Sox. So far in 2023, Schreiber is 1-0 with a 2.12 ERA a seven in 17 innings pitched. He has struck out 21 batters, um, eight walks surrendered, 
a 3.17 FIP, a 1.29 WHIP, good for an ERA plus of 220. Very good reliever so far in 2023 is John Schreiber, and he's doing it with a four-pitch mix. Sinker thrown 31% of the time at 93 miles per hour, a slider thrown 31% of the time as well at 81 miles per hour, a four-seam fastball thrown 28% of the time at 93 miles per hour, a changeup thrown 10% of the time at 89 miles per hour. Those are the four pitches that he's rocking with so far. Uh, Based on this, we see a lot of similarities between Lawrence and Schreiber. Both work primarily with their sinker and slider variations, although Lawrence generates roughly 300 more RPMs than Schreiber generates on his slider. Likely a large reason why Lawrence's sweeper is way more effective with a batting average against of 102 and a WOBA of 120 as compared to Schreiber's 308 batting average against and 354 WOBA on his slider. Um, the, the same in reverse is true. Schreiber's sinker is more effective than Lawrence's with the batting average against and WOBA of 217 and 325 respectively uh, being better compared to Lawrence's batting average and WOBA, WOBA of 0.333, 333, and 422 respectively. That's likely because Schreiber throws that changeup on occasion, which keeps hitters honest while Lawrence only throws the two pitches, the sinker and the sweeper. And even though Lawrence's sinker generates an average launch angle of negative seven degrees, meaning it's on the ground more often than not, as compared to Schreiber's two degrees of launch angle on the same pitch, the changeup really does give Schreiber another solid counter to the sinker. And that changeup generates an average launch angle of negative 11 degrees. Uh, again, a nice compliment to that sinker that he throws. Nonetheless, I think Lawrence has truly become one of MLB's best relievers this season, all things considered. It's hard to make a recommendation for him at this stage in the season. The only recommendation I could really make for him would be to continue balancing the usage of his sweeper and sinker a lot like Schreiber does. If Lawrence could achieve an effective 50-50-ish usage rate of those two pitches. That'll keep him right around the three ERA that he is right now and maybe even drop him back into the twos. I think he had like a 1.65 ERA earlier on into the season, like a month or so in. Overall, during his outings, watch to see if Lawrence is getting batters to struggle in their reaction to his pitches. If he keeps hitters off balance with the sweeper sinker combo, he'll likely generate softer contact and more ground balls, meaning overall a more effective outing. So those are the the analytics behind a few Rockies pitchers coming up on the hitter segment of five man analysis, a veteran hitter struggling to produce consistently and a veteran catcher that may not be much of an upgrade over the guy he replaced, but still he's an upgrade. Adjusting for altitude returns in just a second. Stay tuned. Welcome back to five man analysis. Let's continue this discussion with player number four. Player number four. Player number four is Mike Moustakis, the platoon first baseman kind of at the moment. Occasionally he'll play third or DH. He bats left-handed. And between Crone, Montero, Nolan Jones, Michael Tolia, Ryan McMahon, Moose has mostly been relegated to pinch hit duty. He doesn't really play the field a ton, although obviously with the injuries to Crone and the much more utilized rotation at first base recently, he has gotten a lot more action in the field. So far in 32 games, he's slashing 241 with a 323 on base percentage, good for a 702 OPS as well. Two home runs have been hit. He's knocked in 13 runs. He's walked 11 times, struck out 24 times, good for an OPS plus of 82 he's also had zero errors on the season important to note we like defenders who can defend without making errors especially considering the positional versatility that moose has so far he's kind of struggled to hit fastballs and off well actually he's hit fastballs and off-speed pitches pretty well Uh, with a batting average of 260 against fastballs and against off-speed it's been 286 Fairly respectable, especially for a guy who does not play a lot of the time. However, he has significantly struggled against breaking balls. He's only hitting 182 against that pitch type so far in 2023. And 
Unfortunately, he hasn't recorded enough innings to be placed across the broader array of the MLB percentile rankings, but we do know that he's in the 64th percentile in max exit velo. Not a ton of a surprise there. I mean, he's a bigger guy. He's known over the course of his career for hitting the ball hard, like really hard. Overall, it's been interesting for me to see how Moose's stance has evolved over the season, even back in the offseason when he was working with Marlon Byrd, a former big leaguer, to fix his swing and get back to playing, considering he was still a free agent late into the offseason. Now, recently, Moose has opted for more of a closed stance in the box, and similar to Ryan McMahon, being mindful of the closed stance and the closed plant with their lead leg as left-handed batters has made his swing look a lot more complete. He's still refining a few things as it comes to his timing, but overall, I think for a veteran coming off of multiple injuries over the last few seasons, in his mid-30s, no less, Moose has been okay. He's been okay. A good comparison for Moose in 2023 would probably be Eddie Rosario, who's an outfielder for the Braves. So far in 48 games, Rosario is batting 239 with a 269 on base, 674 OPS. He's hit five home runs, knocked in 18 runs, walked seven times, struck out 44 times. Good for an OPS plus of 79. He also has made an error on the season, but he's an outfielder who gets more playing time than Moose has and does. So, I mean, that might be expected. Rosario overall, who's also a left-handed batter, by the way, is known for having a very close stance in the batter's box, and he's also struggled to hit breaking balls like Moose has. Both hit off-speed pitches pretty well with a batting average somewhere around 270, 280. Um, However, Rosario hits fastballs at a batting average of 323, which is over 60 percentage points better than Moose. So they're very comparable, but obviously Rosario is hitting fastballs better. Why would this be? Personally, in looking at the film, I think this is likely because Rosario starts his hands lower in his stance than Moose does, making it easier for him to get the hands out front on the swing, especially on high pitches. Up and in fastballs especially are tough for lefties to hit in general, so lowering the starting hand position makes it easier for lefties to hit those pitches. If you think about it reasonably, if the higher you start your hands, the harder it's going to be to get momentum in a way that maintains your technique through your swing. And it's just going to make hitting high pitches hard. Ryan McMahon knows this pretty well. He starts his hands pretty high in his stance as well. And I think Moose is suffering from something similar. Rosario, however, like I said, starts his hands lower. So currently Moose starts his hands closer to his head and higher up in his stance, which for him, like I said, has made hitting high pitches more challenging. So I think if Moose lowers his hands a, a tad bit, like closer to where they are at Rosario's level, more around the chest area, maybe even around the shoulder, I think he'll better be able to get his hands out in front on those pitches, especially the high pitches, and get better swings on those fastballs. Fastballs are typically the pitch that are thrown or pitches that are thrown up in the zone more often than not, of all the pitch types. So when Moose is at the plate in games that he plays in, watch to see whether his hands start higher near his head or lower near his chest or shoulder level. Either way, watch to see how he handles the fastballs that he sees during his at-bat. If his hands start lower, I definitely expect him to succeed more often than not at generating solid contact on his swing, not only on fastballs, but on all pitch types in general. Player number five. Player number five is going to be Austin Wins. Backup catcher currently, he bats right-handed. And look, Elias Diaz has been absolutely playing like an all-star this season, which has meant limited playing time for any backup catcher that the Rockies would have envisioned being on this roster in 2023. And for Wins and Servin, that's been exactly the case. They Neither one played a ton when they were or currently are if you're wins, the backup catcher for this team. So, so far in only eight games played for the Rockies in 2023, Austin is slashing 174 with a 259 on base percentage of 477 OPS yet to hit a home run. He has four runs batted in three walks to 10 strikeouts. Good for an OPS plus of 26, 74 percentage points worse than the average major league hitter. Uh, On defense, he has a 38% caught ceiling rate and hasn't committed any errors yet. 
Like Moose, Wins hasn't played enough to be considered in the broader array of MLB percentile rankings, but we do know that he's in the 18th percentile in max exit velocity and in the 43rd percentile in framing. Like, not bad for a relatively below average backup catcher. Wins is obviously a very poor offensive player. Uh, I mean, aside from the stats that I listed earlier, uh, his 118, yes, 118 batting average against fastballs summarizes his struggle pretty well. Like, I don't expect him to be a plus offensive player. Like, his stats say that. His stance also suggests that he won't be a plus offensive player. It requires a lot of complicated mechanisms to all work at the same time. And that just makes his timing a lot more complicated than it has to be. And it's really hard to coordinate. It appears even for him, Uh, but he necessarily wasn't brought in off of waivers to be a good offensive catcher. And he might not even be expected to be a good catcher in general. The only reason Austin wins was really signed was to be better than Brian Servin. Like first and foremost, that was the number one point of signing Austin wins. Mostly defensively better than Servin. That was the the aim, but offensively as well. Ryan Servin was not good. And as a matter of fact, let's just compare the two thus far in 2023 because they played about the same amount thus far into the season. After wins was signed off of waivers, Servin was demoted to AAA Albuquerque. But at the major league level this year, Servin in 10 games played was batting 130 with a 130 on base percentage, meaning he did not walk. He had a 304 OPS, no home runs, one RBI, and he struck out 10 times. Good for an OPS plus of negative 22. Negative 22 OPS plus. That is crazy low. Defensively, he had a 36% caught stealing rate, and he did commit two errors, which in 10 games isn't great. Uh, But I think the numbers say enough about Brian Servin. A negative OPS plus. A negative OPS plus. I've been perusing advanced stats websites for a while now. I don't think I have ever seen a player with a negative OPS plus. I know they exist. I'm just saying I haven't come across one. Brian Servin is the first person I've ever come across who has a negative OPS plus. Think about this. OPS plus, again, just as a reminder, it's a dictator of of how good a player is in any particular category. So ERA plus would be ERA, OPS plus would be OPS, um, adjusted for ballpark factors. And as a comparison to the league with 100 being average, a 100 OPS plus would be average. He's at negative 22. He's not even zero on OPS plus. He is worse than one of the worst possible situations you could possibly have as a major league baseball player. And it's quite crazy. I've never seen that before. I mean, the two more errors than wins as well in only two more games played is also a good dictator that he's not better than wins, but I mean, it's just not good, not good season so far in 2023 for Brian Servin. His demotion was very easily explained. Um, Wins has certainly been an upgrade over Servin offensively and defensively, even though offensively it hasn't really been by much. Defensively, it's certainly been there. Uh, Obviously, you like the fact that Austin Wins is a veteran catcher, been in the league for five years now, so he knows how to work with hitters in a way that Brian Servin might not necessarily know how to work with, or with pitchers rather. He knows how to work with pitchers in a way that Brian Servin might not be able to, as a catcher who's only been in the league for two years compared to wins his five years of service time. So I think all that in consideration wins has certainly been an upgrade, but overall, even though the upgrade in wins has not really been much of an upgrade, the catching situation for the Rockies is pretty much set. Um, Diaz is going to be dominating. It appears like for the foreseeable future, and he's probably going to be at the front of voting for all-star weekend that is he should be an all-star this year at the very least even if he's not voted one he'll most certainly in all likelihood be the Rockies representative for the all-star game if he keeps up just tearing through every pitcher he sees he's batting like 330 something I think maybe 320 something if it dropped during the Diamondback series a little bit Uh, those technique changes that he made really have made him blossom into the guy that we saw at the end of the season in 2021, I want to say. So good for Diaz. He's easily got the starting position on lock for now. But in terms of other catchers, 
that we have in the organization, prospects like Drew Romo, Willie McIver, Hunter Goodman, those guys will be ready to contribute within the next year or so. So all in all, the fact that backup catching has been an issue for the Rockies shouldn't really be a concern. But in terms of wins, again, if he can simplify his swing and just make better contact offensively, especially on fastballs, while defensively remaining a solid catcher who can throw runners out at a high rate, again, 38% is pretty good. Um, he'll be more than serviceable as a backup catcher for the rest of this season. Maybe even if they re-sign him for another season, if those prospects aren't ready, I think he'll be fine. But when he gets a chance to play offensively, watch for him to simplify his swing. I don't know if that's something he's working on, but if he does, uh, it'll probably look something like him moving the bat less before the pitcher throws the pitch. And he'll also be making better contact on fastballs. That's another thing you'll notice when watching him. Defensively, watch to see how our pitchers perform when he's behind the dish. And if runners start attempting to steal, watch how competitive wins his throws are to the base being stolen. If both of those aspects of his game are working well on any given day, I think he'll probably be having a good day, especially by Austin Wynn's standards. Overall, in summary, I think we can take a few things away from the guys we discussed today. Overall, low spin rate fastballs with an effective slider remain the best ingredients for a successful Rockies pitcher. I mean, guys like Kyle Freeland struggle mostly because they can't effectively use their slider. That might be in part due to the fact that their fastballs are fairly ineffective. Um, Bard's high spin rate fastball makes it difficult for him to control, especially between Coors and other venues of lower altitudes. But guys like Lawrence, Justin Lawrence, who throw lower spin rate fastballs, lower spin rate sinkers, they remain effective. Interesting to note. So that remains the best ingredient, successful low spin rate fastball with an effective slider. In terms of offense, bench players continue to struggle for this team and they struggle to consistently contribute mostly offensively. Both Moose and Wins have had substantial offensive shortcomings, which has led them to be below average in terms of hitters in Major League Baseball, but I do think both can improve their performance by making very minor adjustments to their stances and their timing. All in all, I think there's some encouraging potential there, whether they're working on it or not. That's not something I have any information on, but all that matters is that it is possible. Well, that's all she wrote for today's episode of Adjusting for Altitude. We will formally conclude this episode in just a second. Don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Hey, all Christopher here again. Thank you for listening to this episode of Adjusting for Altitude, a Colorado Rockies podcast. We've covered a lot on today's episode, but if you've made it this far in the show, I just want to remind you that your listenership is very much appreciated. On this show, I pride myself in providing Colorado Rockies fans and MLB fans alike with high-quality analysis about the team from the perspective of someone who eventually wants to work in the industry of Major League Baseball as a front office executive. As such, I hope you appreciate the depth and the perspective and the unique opinions I present on this podcast that are seldom discussed on other baseball-related outlets. Again, you can find this podcast on all podcasting platforms. You can follow me on social media at I am the second, I A M T H A S E C O N D. And until next week, God bless and go Rockies. This has been Adjusting for Altitude with Christopher Nelson the second. If you are indeed a fan of Colorado Rockies baseball or simply a fan of MLB content, follow this podcast on your favorite podcasting platform and share this podcast with your friends and family. Baseball in Colorado is a complicated situation, but it is certainly not unsolvable. Until our next episode, take care and go Rockies.